Hello, welcome. Appreciate you coming out. This is the second session of the day for the Transforming Education Pillar of Penn State Startup Week. Uh, want to appreciate, send my appreciation to you for being here and to our online audience. Uh, we've had a, a wonderful online audience today and appreciate you being here. I will say since we are live streaming the event today, if we have any questions during the session, uh, just throw your hand up, let us know. We'll run a mic over to you and you can ask your questions uh, to, to lead using the microphone. Uh, but just wait for two seconds for us to run to you. For those of you online, thank you for being here. This is the second session. When this one is over, we'll be ending this session and you'll be able to join in on the next session that starts at uh, noon. So with that, I want to not only thank you for being here, but thank our presenter today. Today we are uh, lucky enough to have Lee Erickson with us. Uh, Lee has been an entrepreneur, uh, an academic, a uh, co-founder of multiple companies, uh, an instructional designer, uh, and if you don't know Lee, you need to get to know Lee. Because if you're in this entrepreneurship space, she is one of the individuals here at the university that is the ability to help you, not just in positioning you, in helping you find the next steps, helping you make your way with your idea, but also with helping you rethink your idea. And that's gonna be the focus of what we're talking about today. Lee, uh, on, on uh, the LaunchBox website, she describes herself as, as de-risking, helping individuals de-risk their idea, to grow their businesses and to amplify their successes. And she does this as a chief, chief amplifier at Happy Valley Launchbox, which, if you haven't already talked to them out at the office hours area, I would encourage you to do so after we're done today to get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with her. I talked with a, a number of individuals that have gone through Launchbox and talked to them about Lee and, and uh, in preparation for today's event. And one of the things that I heard again and again was basically this. She is the harshest critic you will ever love. <laughs> and sometimes that's what you need when you're going down this path. And so when I sat down with Lee to say, hey, what can, what can we bring to Startup Week? What can you bring to the table that, that young entrepreneurs need for those starting off on this path? What do they need? And the first thing she said was this, don't step in it. The common mistakes that everyone runs into, that she sees people running into as they start to walk down the path. And so we're lucky enough today to have her here to walk through those and to share all of her experience with us. So please help me welcome Lee. Wow, well I don't need that, right? I've got this. Okay, that's quite an introduction. I have no idea if I can, if I can stand up to it. We're a small group, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and let us know. There is time at the end to talk about it. But what I've tried to do is collect the, common, the top 10 mistakes, not in any specific order, more in the order of how you would take a business from idea through um, potentially success, and try to give you some pointers on how to deal with that. Okay, all of us, oh, I, I, there we are. All of us as entrepreneurs have done this at some time. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. It just means it's your first journey. Okay, so step um, first problem number one. I got an idea. An idea is a business. Okay. All right. So everybody is very excited about their idea. They think it's the biggest thing in the world. They're going to be the next. We love going in and out. Uh, we love it that you have that kind of enthusiasm for your idea, care about your idea. That's a problem. So you do need to love it, okay? But it's just an idea, okay? Ideas are easy. Implementation is what's hard. So number three, um, what I think is a fact. I know it's to be true. If you hear yourself when people talk to you say, why do people want this? You say, I think you need to go figure that out, okay? The biggest problem you can have, and I've seen it again, is if you make a false assumption either about who your customer is, the type of problem that they have, or the kind of re relationship they want to have with you and your company, if you're wrong and you act on it, you can, be, you can have a lot of trouble with that, okay? So as Mark Twain says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Okay? So make sure that you test your assumptions. And your assumption can be anything from why people have this problem, who they are, how they're trying to tackle it, how much they will pay for it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Assumptions will kill you. 
Okay? So there's something called customer discovery. If you're interested in this customer discovery, I'm going to show you a book here later. Customer discovery just based talking to your customers. Don't go create a survey and survey 500 people. Go talk to 100 people, one on one. Okay? You want to validate. There's something called test cards again. Strategizer, I'll show you up here, has it where you can actually quantify what you're testing. I believe that people who have this problem will do this this many times if I do this. And you can actually test these things, okay? So what you're trying to do is know what people want. You want to build or create what you know people want, not what you think people want, right? Okay, so how do you do that? Lean Startup is a wonderful book that's, that talks about the lean method, which is learning fast, testing quick. Any of you that are in any kind of technology, think about it as agile versus water development two-week scrums, what can I do to learn really quickly, okay? That is hard because it gets a little theoretical. There's another book called Lean Customer Discovery written by Alvarez. She's one of the people that started Yammer, okay? She gives you very, very specific how to talk to customers, interview customers, and really get to the root of their problem so that you can truly understand who they are. Why is it important? Because then I can mimic back what I heard the customer say, and the customer goes, you get me. You get me, I want to buy from you, okay? And the other thing is, there's a website called Strategizer, and on it they have these things called test cards. And it's a quantitative way. I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, and I said, how many people did you talk to? I talked to 100 people. So what did you find out? Oh, they definitely want, they definitely have this problem. Well, how many of the people had this problem? I don't know. Okay, so was it two? Was it 98? If you count, and you say, 98 people said they didn't have the problem and two had the problem? Do you think it's a problem? No. But unless you count, you'll remember what you want to hear, right? We always try to hear things that we want to hear. So sometimes you can quantify that. Okay. And then learn how to use smoke screens. A smoke screen is a way that you can kind of test that people want it. It could be a landing page that says, coming soon, do you want to sign up for it? How many people could you push to the landing page and how many people signed up? You can change your message, right? So there's a lot of things you can do with that. Okay, the fourth one I think is, everyone's my customer. Uh, this is my favorite quote. I've had 250 people say this. I said, who's your customer? Oh, every, every, everyone's my customer. Oh, oh really? Well, e um, why wouldn't somebody use my project, product? Everyone can. No, that's not true. Who are you targeting? I'm tar targeting college students. Oh, because all college students have the same problem, same needs, same budget. Same, no. So this is a big problem, okay? So what you want to do is you want to look for people with square heads. I know this is an odd thing, but most people start over here with demographics. Students. Well, what is it that's unique about these college? What are the characteristics and the traits? If I'm selling square hats, I might find that people who have square heads <laughs> are my market. And it may go across age. It may go across gender. Graphics are important, but they're not enough. You have to get to the quality of the characteristics of the audience so that you can narrow in on them. This is important because you don't have money as a startup to market to every single college student. You just don't have the money. You don't have the time. So if I can say, it's freshmen who are in STEM, who have come from more than 250 miles away, who are um, anxious about meeting people, okay? I don't know, I made that up. Then I'm much more easy able to find out where they live and get to them, okay? So, all right, you do this again by continually talking to people. This customer discovery you're going to hear over and Understanding the problem and need and being able to art articulate the problem. There's a great thing called the five whys, okay? So if you say, um, I can't think of a problem right now, uh, but every time you ask somebody a question, they say, yeah, I, would, I think that would be interesting. Why? Because it's why. You get down to the root cause of the problem, okay? You need to talk to strangers. The biggest problem I also see is when they do customer discovery, I say, how many people have you talked to? Oh, I've talked to 15 people. Who were they? My roommates. My Aunt Mildred, my Uncle Fred. What are they going to tell you? What's your roommate and your Uncle Fred going to tell you? Oh, I love Johnny. He's just an entrepreneur. It's such a great idea. He's not going to tell you the truth. He's not going to tell you your baby is ugly, okay? You come to me for that, okay? All right. So you're trying to figure out your key characteristics, like I said, of your customer, and then you want to niche. You cannot, as a startup, unless you have a huge infusion of cash, 
sell to everybody. You're much better off if you can find a slice. People don't like to hear that because they say, but, but I'm giving up all those customers. No, you're not. You're just starting here. You're starting here. You're gaining traction. You're learning fast. And then you can expand as you have the capital to do so. So how do you do that? You should talk to 100 potential customers. Talk to 100 customers. There's things called problem statements. You can look them up online. And personas. You need to become an expert on who your person is. Okay? I've lost my clock, so I have no idea where I am in the world. Um, and you need to be able to really clearly define the value proposition. Your value proposition is not a list of features. The value of Uber is not. It's a mobile app that lets me you know, press a button and do this and that. The value of Uber is I can immediately get a, a ride know how soon it's going to come, be able to pay without having cash. Now, how you do that technology-wise, I don't care as a customer. I really don't. I just want you to solve my problem. OK, number six, I think. Um, it's a new solution. I have no competitors. OK? So what I hear often is, I, I don't have any competition. Nobody does what I do. It's not a matter of whether they do what you do or not, OK? What's a competitor for an umbrella? What does an umbrella do? Keeps you dry. Who are competitors for umbrellas? Rain jacket. Does it do what an umbrella does? Not exactly the same way, but it solves the problem. What else? When you don't want to get wet, what else do you do? Hat. Get in a car. <laughs> or you do nothing. You just get wet. Sometimes your competitor is nothing. Okay. All right. So, Grumpy Cat would say, you know, if there's a difference between saying I can beat my competition than saying I have no competition. You have competition. What you're doing is you're trying to figure out what are the alternative solutions that people are using today to solve the problem or get close. All of those are your competitors. Okay. You need to follow the money, right? Especially in the B2B world, business to business world. Somebody is is fighting for the dollars that your consumers try to give you. Where are they putting their dollars today? How do you get their dollars? Okay. You also need to look at industry trends. What's happening in your industry? Um, Google it. It amazes me that, that the millennials are supposed to be the best people to search the internet, haven't got a clue on how to search the internet unless it's something personal. <laughs> so Google it. And what you don't Google is, an app that lets me call a taxi cab. You don't do that, because that's not what your customer would do, right? You Google what your customer would say if they were looking for something, OK? And how do you know what your customer would say? You've talked to 100 of them, OK? And that's how you find out who your competitors are, OK? What you're looking for is product market fit. Product market fit is I clearly understand who my customers are. I understand the value that I provide to them. And that's a fit. What I provide fixes their problem. OK, so how do you do this? Um, SBDC Small Business Development Center has a market research arm. OK, they have hours down at the launch box. You can get them to do some industry reports for you. OK, do a competitive analysis. Google what everybody else is trying to um, Google to find a problem. Go look at every single one of those sites. Write down what they say they do. Write down who they are, what they charge. and find out who the customers are. And if you can, go use their products. Go use their products. Be the consumer. Okay? And find an expert in an industry. One of the things that, that is hard for students is you're, you're, you know, you're 18, 20, 21, whatever. You just haven't been out in the world enough. Okay? That's not a hit. That's just you haven't been there long enough. Go find somebody that understands the history, industry. If you want to disrupt the point of sale industry in a restaurant, you need to know how restaurants work and how data flows in restaurants. So go find somebody who can help. You as students right now can pick up the phone or do a LinkedIn message to an alumni, and nine out of 10 times, they will talk to you. When you graduate, that goes down to three out of 10. Use it. It's amazing. We have over 500,000 alumni. Call them up. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm interested in starting something. You're in the same industry. Could I have 20 minutes of your time just to get some of your advice and insights? Nine out of 10 times, they will do that for you. All right, this is another one. Coding is progress. 
okay? Progress, right? It's not progress, okay? Lines of code do not equal having a solution that anybody wants, okay? So um, this is Eric Reese. He was the one that wrote, um, he started, what if we found ourselves building something that nobody wanted? In that case, what did it matter if we did it on time and on budget? You know, I'm on budget and I'm on time. Nobody cares. This is why you do customer discovery, so that you can build what no people want, not what you think they want. The days of being in a room and building a huge monolithic program or a service or a product are gone because we can rapidly develop now and the cost of that has gone down. Stay lean. Lean means do only what you can do in two weeks. Okay? Embrace constraints. It's actually a good thing not to have a lot of money because it makes you MacGyver things. It makes you embrace constraints and do things and get scrappy. And that's really important when you're first starting. Learn about what an MVP is. Not the most valuable player, but the minimum viable product. What's the smallest thing that I can do today to help my customer and provide some value? It's not the complete solution. It's not a half-assed solution or a crappy solution. It's just part of a solution, okay? There you go. <laughs> you can worry about scaling later. Don't take 49 years to figure out how to scale to have millions and millions of people and you don't even have one. Okay? Also, a lot of people say, well, I don't want to put something out now because it'll kill my brand. Like you, don't, you don't have a brand to kill. It's not a problem. Okay? If you're really concerned about that, you can put it out under another name as a test. Right? So if you're company A and you want to do a smoke screen, a trial MVP, say you're company B, right? If you're worried. There's ways around that, okay? Um, so a great book from 37 Signals that's online, it's free. It's called Get Real, okay? 37 thing, six Signals was the people that created Ruby on Rails, you know, for any techie people. And it's really very easy to digest. They're very, 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 very lean. In some ways, they may be too lean. But what they're great about is they know exactly how big they wanted to be, exactly how to figure out how to do it very lean, very cost efficiently, and grow in a way they could handle. There's also online, Sam Altman has something called How to Start a Startup. A lot of great information on that. Um, and then go look at the different kind of MVP models. There's different models. There's something called the um, concierge, the concierge model, the MVP model. I'll, I'll tell you the quick Zappos story. You all know who Zappos is? What do they do? Sell shoes. When they first started selling shoes, we didn't know if people would buy shoes on the internet. I remember when there was, there was no internet to the public. It's crazy. You had, to actually, you had to actually go to a phone and you were tethered to the wall. Okay, I'll stop. Um, so, what they did was, he's like, I don't know if people are going to buy shoes. So what he could have done is built a website and got inventory and created an e-commerce system and created an inventory system and made sure that if somebody ordered the shoe online that he had it in the back and created this whole supply chain. That's not what he did. What he did was he created a front page website. He went down to the local shoe store and the person who owned the shoe store, he said, I'm going to try to sell shoes online. If I if I sell them, I'll come and get them from you. Can I take pictures of your shoes? And the manager said, okay. So he took pictures of all the shoes in this retail shoe store. They put them up online. He made it look like you were filling out a form. You weren't filling out a form. It was just sending him an email. There was nothing behind the scenes. When he got an order, he went back and bought the shoes from the shoe stop. He went to the post office and he got a box and he shipped it to the United States Post Office. Okay? He was able to set that up in like three weeks and test, right? Versus building a huge e-commerce inventory system. So he reduced his risk of failure by learning quick and by not putting tons of money into it. That's what's called a wizard of Oz. Like you don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. So learn about MVPs. There's some really cool things you can do there. And analytics are huge. You can test anything today in terms of whether people are coming to a website, how many people are coming, how long are they staying, are they clicking on links, you can do what's called A-B testing and say message one sends them here, message two sends them here, what's the rate? So you can learn a lot. So learn about how to leverage analytics. Okay, um, number seven, uh, if I'm a startup, I'm going to get VC money. N probably not. 
less than 1% of all companies in the United States are funded by venture capital. Okay. More than likely, where are you going to get your money from? Friends, families, and fools is what they call it. Okay. I didn't make the fool part up. They did. Right? Or maybe angel investment. Okay. Unicorn, I'm so tired of the unicorn myth, right? I'm just, it's, I, yes, there are people, especially in Silicon Valley, if you're in the club, and it's a very small club, <laughs> where they're just writing checks back and forth. But that's really not the reality, right? Most entrepreneurs are self-funding, right? They're doing it through their savings. They're doing it through credit card debt. I don't suggest that. I'm not suggesting you do that, okay? Or they're doing it through friends and family, okay? So I want to debunk the myths of the unicorn. It's hard work, okay? So you need to keep your head down and build a great product before you make money. Before anyone will really invest in you, you have to prove that you have something for them, okay? So you want to show that you have some kind of traction. It's not going to happen overnight. You need to understand how many customers you have in order to show that you can make money. Venture capital people are investing in you because they want a five to ten times return on their money in three to five years. That's huge growth. Angel investors will give you a slightly less, they, and they typically will have a slightly less return ex expectations. Okay, so learn about learn about those kinds of things. Okay, you need to have some kind of traction. Okay, your team is huge. Oftentimes, and I'm sure you've heard this, we're betting on the team more than the idea, okay? Typically, your idea and your solution will not survive first entry to market because you're learning. That's not because you're students, it's just what entrepreneurs do, okay? So your team is really important. It takes us all the way back to number two. Make sure you have people on your team that are smart, that have complementary skills, that can get the job done, that understand the industry, that are coders, that are analytical whizzes, whatever it is that you need, Okay, that's the five to 10x, right? And the other thing is, if you want to have VC money, you have to have a warm intro. The chances of you taking a proposal, putting up on a venture capital site and say, give me money, when they don't know you, is really, 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 really low. So start now networking. Start now meeting people. Because if you have a warm intro and somebody knows you and they will introduce you to a VC, you're more than likely to be able to get some attention. So bootstrap. Bootstrap means do it on the cheap, right? Figure out how to get it done quickly and cost effectively. And there's a great, Kai Kawasaki has a great video on bootstrapping, okay? Create a advisory board. Find people that will push you, that have industry expertise and entrepreneurial expertise, and surround yourself with them and say, I like to have an advisor. I like three people, four people that I meet with once a month to just kind of keep me on track and help me. One, you will learn that you are making similar mistakes that they made, and that actually makes you feel better. And two, they can kind of hopefully push you quicker. And three, they'll see how interested you are, and they'll introduce you to other people, and you build your network. Okay? Um, understand caps table and dilution. If you're going to go down the VC route, and I never took VC money in any of my companies because I, I refused to give up control. One. Uh, and two, I didn't want to be that behemoth person. Like, I wasn't interested in doing that for all sorts of reasons. But if you're going to go there, make sure you understand the math, okay? If you're getting funded by a venture capital, you will not own the majority of your business. It's not going to happen. You're, you know, you're lucky to get away with 5 10 percent, okay? Oh, hello, Moto. Did I break it? <laughs> this is a this is why I got out of teaching in IST, because I have this effect on technology. Okay, so number eight, startup mode means I'm winging it. I'm just winging it. There's no process for it, okay? So this is Corel. I know you can't see it. So sometimes I'll start a sentence, and I don't even know where it's going, okay? That's not how you do a startup. That's not how you run a business, okay? There is actually a process, right? I love this quote from Mike Tyson. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, okay? So... You're going to have to change. You're going to have to adapt. Things are going to come at you, and it's going to be difficult. If you find that anxiety provoking, don't do a startup. If you find that you have to get something done in four hours, and you don't have any idea what you're doing, and you find that a challenge, and that's just like, I'm going to do it, then maybe entrepreneurship is for you. Okay? So 
One thing you can do is set three months gold. I set, see a lot of startups that they say they have no goals. They've, they've not written it down, right? If you do not know where you're supposed to be in three months, how will you know if you're behind or ahead? Write down the goals. Write down what you want to accomplish in terms of either building something, talking to customers, understanding industry, increasing your network, whatever it is. It's going to change, and that's OK. But at least write it down. Figure out how to manage projects. The biggest problem that I see with especially student teams is that they have great ideas, but when it comes to actually making it a project and executing on it and setting deadlines, they just can't pull the plug for some reason. I don't know what it is, okay? So if you want to do it, you should have somebody on your team that knows how to manage the bejesus out of a project. And what that means is breaking it down into small different chunks. It's not, in three months we'll have built our platform. I, 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 you can't manage that. It's too big. So find somebody to help you project manage. Understand cash flow. Understand how much money is going out, how much money is coming in, and what the potential is. Because that will tell you how long you can survive, and that will tell you whether it's even a viable product. SBDC can help you with that too. Okay? Figure out what your business model is. The business model canvas is a great tool to help you with that. It's not a 20-page business plan. Startups do not need to write 40, 20-page business plans because they don't know what their business is yet. Doing five to 10-year sales projection, it, it means nothing. Now, some people will argue with me about that, but that's OK. You, that's the other thing you're going to hear is you're going to have 20 different people give you 14 different types of advice. So, but in the beginning, if you figure out basically who am I serving, what value am I providing to them, how am I doing that, how do I make money? Is it subscription? Is it freemium? And what are the things I need to do to make that happen at a high level? You can get a gauge to see whether or not it's even viable or not. Okay. Pivot. Pivot. Pivot is the term we use that basically says you have to change direction. You're going to have to pivot. Be willing to do that. I've had a lot of entrepreneurs who say, no, I know, I know this is exactly what it is, right? And they'll say, well, you know, Steve Jobs, they always hold Steve Jobs. Okay. Steve Jobs did a lot of customer discovery. He understood user experience. He actually didn't just sit in a room and it came to him, right? He had a process and a method for figuring it out, right? And he definitely pivoted, okay? So Udacity, which is a free online system, has a great um, how to build a startup course by Steve Blank. It's a bunch of short two to three minute videos, easily digestible, okay? And it will take you through the whole process of the business model canvas, and it's free, right? Um, Use tools. I don't know if anybody used Trello. Trello is a great way. It's free. I'm all about the free. Trello is a great way um, to do project management. It's easy to share. It's easy to do cards. You can set dates. You can set all sorts of things. Basecamp is something else that you can use if you have an educate. I think if you have an uh, EDU, you can get that for free. It's project management software. It has chat boards in it and different. You can upload files, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then accelerators. Accelerators is a great way to get you going and moving. Um, Launchbox does accelerators three times a year, spring, summer, fall. It's 10 weeks. Um, you um, get 24-7 access to our facility for a year. Uh, we take no equity. We charge no rent because we love you. It's free. Um, so you meet once a week as a group. Um, to talk about things, I bring speakers in, I bring networking events in, um, you get, you have a one-on-one -on -one for an hour every week with me, you can decide whether that's a showstopper after this discussion or not. Um, but any accelerators are great ways when you're ready to kind of push you and accelerate your, <laughs> hence the name. Um, nine, okay. I have to have a perfect product when I launch. You don't. Okay, this is great. Dear optimist, pessimist, and realist, while you guys were busy arguing about the glass of wine, I drank it. Sincerely, the optimist, okay? Oftentimes, especially in this technology world, you have to get out there and get out there early and first, okay? You don't always have an advantage as the first mover, but oftentimes, if you can figure out what the problem is and pivot and learn quickly, you're going to have an advantage. Okay, this thing is being... Okay, so we talked about MVPs, okay? Figure out how to do that. Deal with two-week sprints, right? Figure out how to make it um, quickly. Fail fast. Failure is not bad, okay? 
What, do you, what happens when you fail? You figure out how to do it better. That's okay, right? I want this generation to turn the word failure into learning, okay? So you learn fast. Oh, this thing is, okay, learn fast. Spend time on user experience. I am a firm believer that user experience is tomorrow's competitive advantage, okay? If you think about Starbucks, they sell coffee, for God's sake, right? Coffee. But what do they do? They make it an experience, down to the colors of the walls that are earth tones, down to barista. They have a whole language, right? Some people love it, some people don't. But they clearly are providing an experience. And also focus on user interface. They're different things. The user experience is what happens from the moment they engage with you. How many of you have Apple phone? How many of you still have the box? OK. And the, uh, the couple of you didn't admit it. Okay, so it's an experience. When you take it out of the box, you're having an experience with that brand. You haven't even touched the product. That's what we mean by end-to-end -end user experience. It's beyond the product. It's not just the solution. It's from the moment they engage you all the way through, and that will be tomorrow's competitive advantage. Okay, so learn about things. Um, MIT, App Inventor, these are um, tools that are free that can help you rapidly prototype things. I, know, I, I realize that I tend to be more technology, digitally focused, but that's my background. Um, look up what, what experience mapping is. Experience mapping is starting at the beginning of the person's journey. There's a lot of good stuff online about this. Beginning of their journey, understanding all the challenges they face, all the objections that they'll face, et cetera, et cetera. And that will allow you to figure out where there's pain and how you can make it better and how you can differentiate yourself. And then once you bring somebody on board, there's a great site called useronboard.com, which breaks down the entire onboarding, which is getting people to your site, downloading and getting your product, breaks it down for all the major brands and you can see how they do it. Okay, okay. last one. Hours worked equals success, okay? Abraham Lincoln. If I had six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend the first four on the saw, okay? It's about preparation. It's about working smart and working hard. It's not just about working hours, right? Because you can be very ineffective that way, okay? Work smarter, create milestones. We go back to those three-month goals. Figure out how you can learn fast. Figure out the thing that's going to tank you if you're wrong and go figure out how to fix it, okay? The other thing is if you're working on projects, figure out how much time you're spending, right? Especially when you get to the project management things, right? Uh, especially if you're building software. You have to know how much time it takes you to do things. So start tracking the time you're spending on different things and estimate how long it's going to take. Because if you say, oh, I think I can do that in 20 hours, and you find out it takes you 60, you, you kind of need to know that, right? because that imp implies costs and times. Learn from others, okay? One of the things that I was terrible about as an entrepreneur was asking for help. Because I thought if I asked for help, that meant I didn't know, and because I was the CEO, I kind of had to have all the answers. No, don't make that same mistake, okay? So, um, The Art of the Start, and actually I think it's The Art of the Start 2.0, is a great book by Guy Kawasaki. He also has some things online if you don't want to have to actually touch paper, that's fine. You want to learn how to test critical assumptions. Again, those strategizer test cards can help you. And get out of the building. Get out of your dorm room. Get out of your apartment. Go out and talk to people. Experience things, right? Be gorilla in that. Okay, bottom line. I love this one. Good frosting can't save a bad cake, okay? Smoke and mirrors. If what you're fundamentally doing nobody cares about, it doesn't matter how pretty it is. It doesn't matter how well the UI looks. It doesn't matter how quickly it can do things behind the scene. It just doesn't matter. The cake is bad, okay? So, there's a formula for entrepreneurship. Did you know that? Here, okay, here it is. P3 times V times E equals the delta, the change. P3 is the percent to which you're pissed off or passionate about the problem. You have to care. Otherwise, you just won't do it. Think about the classes you're in. The classes that you find exciting and you want to learn, you spend more time doing. The classes that you care less about, you put in an eh effort. You can't be eh when you run a startup. You have to be all in. It stands for vision. Your ability 
and your team's ability, because it's not just you, remember we, the unicorns don't exist, at least in Happy Valley, um, the, the vision that you have for fixing the problem. Okay? And E, what's E stand for? What? Oh, I like that. Execution. Okay? Can you execute? And that's the change of the success. If you're pissed off about a project problem that really matters and you have this amazing idea how to fix it, but you cannot execute yourself out of a paper bag, you're done. If you have an amazing problem that you're passionate about and you know how to execute, but the vision that you have doesn't really solve the problem, you're done. If you have vision and execution, but you're working on something that nobody cares about or there's not a big enough audience, you're done. You have to have them all. I will tell you that the entrepreneurs who know and see their customers and say, I have to fix that. That's not why. So as you go through life looking for your problems, every time you go, this is ridiculous. Why does this have to be this way, right? Or this person shouldn't have to do that, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And you can be um, find things that matter and still make money. That doesn't make you terrible. So that's a lot of information. I understand. But now what I want to do is I want to hear, we have some entrepreneurs in the audience. I'd love your thoughts. I'd love to hear what you're struggling with, any questions you have, any comments you have. And this is the audience participation part. And then we'll sit here for like four or five minutes because nobody wants to do their hand first. And inevitably somebody I know will start it off and then it'll be good. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh! Okay, we gotta have to do a mic because we have people online. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob. I'm an international student from Ecuador, Excellent. and uh, I'm actually uh, going to set up my startup in Ecuador. Okay, uh, it's gonna be a solar panel distribution um, installation and um, maintenance company. Excellent. Uh, I already have the supplier. It's based in Guatemala. Okay. Uh, I actually just got my name too. Uh, I got my domain for my website. What's it called? Uh, it, it's in Spanish, right? Uh, but it's, shameless promotion. You all right. Do it. So it's uh, eh, solparatutecho.com, which means sun for your roof. Dot com. Okay. And it's because in Latin America there is this huge movement that's called Techo para mi país, which uh, gives uh, houses to poor people. So that rings bells, uh, mm -hmm. and, and a vast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, yeah, I actually had a question. Where can I build like a smoke screen website here in Penn State? I have no IT expertise. Like that's my weakness in my. Okay. Startup. So here's the beauty of the internet: Weebly, WordPress, Wix. Anybody else have any other, right? They're free. You can do them. Yeah. You don't have to. Wix. A lot of people, a lot of students like Wix. W-I-X. Um, it's very, very, it's very easy and very free. The thing that you would need help, I would suggest you do, is when you do the free versions, it'll be Wix dot whatever, right? So you, you, that's not good for your brand, right? But you can just redirect that and that's fairly easy to do those are free they have templates okay. that you can just go find a template that does what you want it to do and then upload pictures and upload content it's never it's never been easier Perfect. thank you so much okay anybody else anybody working on or thinking of an idea what you got i want to hear what you're working on my name is joyce musangu um I have a plan to also start a company, a construction company, okay. prefab construction company mm -hmm. in the Congo. I'm originally from okay. the Congo. Uh, but I would like to know the steps that, or the ideas that you shared with us. When do we start, or uh, when do we start, um, I mean, the incorporation process, like the name and, when now, just, just do it now. So if you do it for everything you... Well, so you kind of have an idea of what you want to do, right? Yeah. Um, you don't have a product yet, right? No. Okay. So when you think that you want to, one, bring others on as a team, you often want to have your company incorporated so that the company owns the intellectual property and you're making an agreement with the company, right? It's not a personal agreement. So you'd need that set up to do that. You can call, you can incorporate under a name like Fred 
and then trade under the name that you want the world to know. Mm. So it's not, once you do that, it's not a name. Okay. What I would suggest you do is set up, if you come out, we have cards out in the room that I think you were in earlier, mm -hmm. and set up an appointment with the legal clinic, and they can talk to you about timing, okay. completely free. You're right, until you're doing a splash, or you're creating um, arrangements and creating a team, you, you can kind of go solo with that, right? But it's not a big deal to do it, and it will provide you some level of protection. The hardest thing to do about a name, if you're going to find a name, your website needs to be the name of your company. Don't do dashes, don't do dot co's, don't do dot, you want the dot com. You can get it. It's hard. Sometimes what you can do is you can put that my in front of, like Emma is a mailbox mailing service and they have their URL as my Emma. Okay, so sometimes you can do that. But you want to, there's five things you want to do when you find a name. Okay, maybe six. One, um, you need to Google it. Make sure that other people don't have that name. Two, you need to go to Urban Dictionary and make sure it doesn't mean something disgusting. I'm not kidding about this, okay? Because we make up words and then we find them in Urban Dictionary and it's a problem, okay? Um, three, you need to go to the United States Patent and Trademark TESS, T-E-S-S -S, database and make sure that it doesn't have, somebody already have a trademark on it. That doesn't mean they that's not a complete database, but if it's there, you, you've got a problem, okay? Um, six, you need to be able to spell it and pronounce it, okay? This is getting harder, and you need to be able to get the .com URL. That's the hardest one, because every word in the English language is gone, okay? So that's when we get makeup words, right? And so, so I would say, you know, focus on those things. Try to find a name. You've got time, right? Um, I don't know, because you're doing an international business, this is where I'm out of my domain. You need to understand what that means in terms of trading in the United States and all those kinds of things for, for both of you. Okay. But, yeah, I would say as soon as you're wanting to create anything formalized with other people as a team or you're going to want to put yourself out into the world it pro and provide some kind of service, it provides some protection for you personally in terms of uh, liabilities. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> uh oh, I don't know about this one. Uh huh. So Lee, is there uh, um, in thinking about a startup? Am I always thinking about a product, a thing, a tangible thing, a box or something, or do I do I also am I also thinking about like services mm -hmm. and yep. how do I figure those two things out? Oh, gosh, that's a big one. So, yes, it could be a physical product, a digital product, or a service. A service would be, think of consulting, right? So I had a marketing agency. It's a services agency. I wasn't selling product. I was selling expertise and services, right? I think, really, it goes to what the nature of the problem is and what the customer wants. So, for example, um, this question you asked about the website, okay? The product is Wix. Can you think of a service around building websites. Graphic design. Graphic design, right? Or what I did was I built websites for companies, okay? So here's the difference. Same problem, I need to build a website. Different customer, different need, okay? You just want a quick smokescreen website. It's cheap, fine, do it. Great. I'm a big company, I need a custom thing that has something behind, right? So I think it really goes down to the specific customer need, right? And, and that's an example also of where you have different customer needs, okay? The Wix ones is the do-it-yourself. I'm not going to spend a lot. I'm going to do it. I have some little level of technology need. That's all I need, okay? Those were not my customers. My cust I used to charge five to $10,000 for a logo. Those days were gone, right? Because what happened? Fiverr, 99 designs, et cetera, et cetera, okay? If you're a small business, that's fine for you. But if you are a large business, you have to have levels of expertise. So I think it goes back to customer discovery. You're going to find, if you say, I'm going to help people build websites, my first question is going to be is, who? What are their needs? I need something quick I can do relatively easy and free, right, and quickly. 
versus I need a professional job that has a back-end database that can pull data from different sites. And so that's, that, that's I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my story. <laughs> okay, anything else? Yeah. Hi. I'm good. How are you? Good. So I have a question for somebody who's... Hi. So somebody who has experience and an entrepreneurial spirit but works for, let's say, a large organization, so an entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. can you speak a little to awesome. best practice or advice or experience you've had or seen successes with somebody who worked for a big organization and had the opportunity to take that spirit and create some really great projects, yeah. products, that's, that's departments? That's a great question vision, things like that? So I would also tell you what students, so which, what, what Ashley's talking about is intrapreneurship, right? So that is using a lot of the tools and techniques and the mindset of an entrepreneur in an established organization. This is becoming more and more critical because it used to be that if you were the incumbent, the, the company that had the market on this, you could have it for 10 or 15 years. It's, that's down to like three to five, okay? Because technology, right? Technology is lovely, but it's, it's, it's really hurting large businesses. So they have to be more mobile. They have to figure out new opportunities. So I would say a couple things. I'd say one, I think it depends on the organization. They have to want it. But I think that what I have heard over and over again from recruiters is that they're looking for people do the customer discovery that can identify a need, figure out quickly who has it and what they want, then figure out how to get them a solution quickly and to test and iterate very, very quickly. So all the things we talked about for a startup, you could apply in a company to either a new market or to a new, um, um, a new product. There's a great book called The Innovator's Method, not dilemma, but method. And what it does is it says, how do you take lean startup processes and philosophies and implement them in a large traditional organization? And here's the rub. If I am a company and a startup, I'm different. A company is somebody who knows what their business model is, knows what they deliver, understand who their product is, and they're just trying to get efficient at doing it. Right? It's all about productivity and efficiency, not about innovation because right, I know who I'm selling to. A startup is a company that's living in total uncertainty. They don't know what their business model is. They're not exactly even sure what their solution is. Okay? It takes two different people to run those companies. Large companies that are executing need managers. They need people that, that, that reduce risk, <laughs> right? that make things known. Okay? That's not great for innovation. So it's hard sometimes to get people that are focused on manufacturing or productivity to think one they're not incented to do so because they're told I want to know how much money you're gonna make in three to five years you gotta make certain money I wanna see your profit margin go up you're not talking about that as a startup so that's that's the rub so I think what I've heard is that students that have entrepreneurial skills and have have spent time in a startup are often more interesting to large companies because they understand the product market customer discovery concepts. Um, and I think somebody that's got more experience like you would be, is working with managers. You might look at that book to see how you can get them to think a little bit more leaner. <laughs> I don't can, I, can I ask one more quick yeah. question on that same vein? So um, can you speak a little bit to, if you have not about design thinking and oh, that approach to my best topic innovation, ever. entrepreneurship, okay. and... Okay. Okay, a couple, couple of you. So design thinking is a process where you, one, empathize with the customer. Everything comes back to the customer, right? Think about it like dating. I'm serious. It's like dating. You want to know the person inside and out so you know how to get to them and get them interested. <laughs> so design thinking starts with empathy, okay? Which is really understanding the person, the root cause of the problem, and then quickly ideating how you could fix it. But the beauty of design thinking is you don't worry about whether it's viable or feasible. You just, if you had superpowers and you could do whatever you want, what would you do? 
Now, you think that's kind of silly, but that's where you start. And why do you start there? Because it opens up opportunities for innovation and insight. I'll give you an example. We had somebody at the lunchbox who wanted to create a food company because the problem that he identified was students want to eat healthier, but their busy, crazy schedules that are unpredictable mean that they're ordering out three to four times a week, and they're ordering pizza and wings, and they think that's probably not a sustainable way to live. Okay. So first thing that comes to mind, Blue Apron. Let's box up stuff and send them to him. He did customer discovery. They're like, no, I don't want to have to. I don't want to have to chop it. I don't want to have to cook it. That's like way too much work, right? I, I want it here when I want it, and I want it to be good. Okay, so we did a design thinking sprint. And what you do in the sprint is you have Play-Doh and popsicle sticks and boxes and tape and plastic and all sorts of stuff, and you just kind of MacGyver up what you think solutions might be. Okay, and what he made was a Play-Doh mom. He made like a little Play-Doh robot mom that shows up at your apartment, gives you a meal, and then goes away, right? That goes away being the, the most important part. Um, and so we said, okay, you're not gonna be able to do that, but what does that mean? Okay, mom means trusted source, so people want trusted source. Homemade suggests healthy, all right? Mac and cheese is not particularly healthy, okay? But it's a comfort food, so it really wasn't that, it wasn't that they wanted healthy food, it's that they wanted comfort food, okay? And they didn't want any preparation they wanted to be taken care of. So what he was able to do with that is really understand the insights and think about the messaging, okay? Wish your mom was there to cook you, cook you mac and cheese and da 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 Right. So now he's got, you know, it's mama's so-and-so, and he delivers food in Tupperware containers, and he tested baking versus nuking, microwave versus baking. The assumption he made is that people, that students would put it in the oven and bake it at 350 for 30 minutes. How many of you would do that? Very, not as many, a couple, right? Most of you are like, uh-uh, I want to nuke it, right? So now he understands the customer, the desires, the messaging, the packaging. Now you put it in nukable containers and you have handwritten notes from Mama Sprango, right? About how, to, how long to nuke it. You do two servings because he tested this. Students will eat the same thing two days in a row. Okay, you give them two servings. So from the design thinking sprint where we kind of just said, let's just, let's just be crazy and imagine, we were able to bring that back to something that was feasible and viable, but it was cruelly connecting with the emotions and the need and the experience that the customer wanted to have. So that's, that's an example as design, you know, and we run sprints down at the launch box, so if you're ever in any of the entrepreneurship classes, um, hopefully I'll get to see you down there. Okay. What do we got? Anything else? We got our next speaker showed up. Any of you that are here, you ought to stay and want, listen to Herbert because he's going to talk about how to do a good presentation. And I got to show in mind because I don't want I don't want you to see what I did. So, all right. So I'm gonna I actually have to run off here to be down at Launchbox. Launchbox is open 8:30 to 4:30. You can put on the desk if you want to have a conversation with me. I love talking with entrepreneurial students, um, and my job is to figure out how to get you what you need. Okay. So let me know. But thank you so much for your attention, and and I'm out. Thank you so much.